Well, it's good to be in this room because three years ago, the conversation on artificial intelligence, the centrifuge of it, was eight people in a room trying to figure out where are we going to go with this and what are we going to do to deliver the technologies to our users, to our end customers. A year and a half later, the room looked sort of like this. Maybe there are 15 or 20 people there. And then now, we sit right now. So I want to say thank you to begin with, to Kirk, to KPMG, uh, for GovExec for hosting this, and most of all, you guys for being here, because it represents a marked difference in the conversation that we're having as we move towards a more pragmatic uh, conversation and something different. Because for the past two years, since the National Defense Strategy, and this will be the only time that I mention that, the conversation has remained at an impasse. It's just sat there saying, we recognize that there is an issue at hand, but at the same token, we're not moving forward. What are we doing about it? We're just saying, great power competition. We know we have problems. We know that this will change the world, but how do we discuss it and what do we do about it with our workforces, with the public, uh, and internal to our organizations? With that, we have people we have to communicate with. And our workforce, as it stands right now, when we say artificial intelligence, and it's natural within this room, we anthropomorphize it, and we start thinking about these robotic men, these things that exist. We have Hollywood to thank for that. But we must get beyond that conversation. We have to get beyond the point in which we're thinking about robotic men and realize that this really is something we can use to aid ourselves in everyday life. But how do you have that conversation about something that's more akin to electricity than it is to oil with the entirety of our workforce? To help them understand where machine learning is beneficial for them, where it is not beneficial, where automation is good, where automation is not good, and all the subsequent actions we have to take. We also have an entire different audience that we have to pay attention to. And it's from those in this room as well that are messaging the same thing. Because what we do with artificial intelligence, and it stems from that whole idea of robotic people, the question is, what are we going to do with AI? And that's an important conversation we'll talk about in a moment. But the moral, ethical, and legal dilemmas that we will face are different than those who don't face those same things or have a different value systems than the ones in which we espouse for everyone else. This will be tough because those who don't move forward lose their comparative advantage because there's no such thing as a sustained comparative advantage, but also without our leadership on this from each agency, from every senior leader, from our national populace, authoritarian regimes will take charge, and they will set the standards. Just yesterday, or two days ago, uh, news just broke about the Chinese government leading um, an image recognition computer vision standards workshop. How did that happen? How, how were we not a part of that conversation, and how was that conversation not led by us? And that's an important thing that we have to pay attention to, and that means that we have to deliver principles for our workforce that are consumable, that help with everyone. Because again, for a technology more akin to electricity, the same techniques that we're gonna use for personnel management, the same techniques that we're gonna use for finance or acquisition or legal review, they will inform the more tough data sets. They'll inform the more difficult decisions of where we place AI appropriately and where we shouldn't. So for the United States Air Force, what we want to do is provide principles. This follows on to the Department of Defense artificial intelligence strategy itself as an annex for the United States Air Force. You can Google this right now. We released it publicly because we believe in transparency and a different way of going about this business and messaging and collaboration. Furthermore, you can find it on the White House website um, and all of the other AI type of places you can look on the internet. So before we get to that conversation, back to that robotic piece, there's something that as, as a people, 
for users that we have to get past. The first thing of that is, is when we talk about the words intelligence, learning, and consciousness, we often conflate them. Perhaps we're talking about intelligence. Perhaps we're talking about consciousness. Perhaps we're talking about learning, something that changes over time with the presentation of new data. All of those conversations, since the dawn of time, what we have done as humans is we imbue consciousness first. So if I say the word intelligence, people will just define a definition for that right now. Something doing a thing for a purpose, whatever that is. Learning, it changes over time. Naturally though, we said consciousness must come first. Ever since the mechanical Turk uh, playing chess, it was a robotic man playing chess in the 1600s, and we were still fooled and still thinking about, well, where does consciousness arise? Perhaps we will never get the answer to what is consciousness. But for our purposes, that does not matter. And there is no technology on the foreseeable future that will generate consciousness. So I ask, and I think that this is a useful uh, uh, tool and conversation to have, whether, with its, whether it's a maintenance user on a flight line in my case, or all the way up to Boff's Secretary of Defense, is to start the conversation here and to take that first prerequisite of consciousness and move it to the bottom of the equation. Intelligence. Well, surely the nest in your home must have one unit, we'll say, of intelligence. It can measure the atmosphere, it measures the temperature, it measures you in the room or your habits and says, well, it should be a little bit warmer or a little bit cooler. I sleep with like 65 degrees, so cooler for me. But this is an important conversation and it's something that helps evolve the dialogue to a place that otherwise doesn't exist and to learn over time. We wonder if a spider in the corner of the room is conscious if I'm there, right? I, I think my you know, bulldog has some consciousness, but the reality is, is things can learn and be intelligent without biology. And that's a, that's a step to take forward as we think about how AI benefits us. I just recently spoken to a friend who was in China for the past three weeks talking about artificial intelligence. I said, well, how did they feel? How, did, how does the average person feel about AI? And they were excited. They said, it's making their life better. Alternatively, the things that they are doing do not align with our values. They are completely outside the norms of how you should respect human dignity and how the West sees it, but their lives are better comparatively to where they were. They see it as an opportunity while we're still talk, talking about Terminator. So principle one, you often hear, and that we'll discuss, you'll hear it multiple times a day, the United States government does not lead the research and development and application of artificial intelligence, machine learning, RPA, et cetera. And we sit on that conversation over and over and over again. When we say, next step, what do we do about that? If that is true, which it is, then we must do things differently. So principle one for the United States Air Force strategy, broadly applicable to other agencies uh, as well, is drive down technological barriers to entry. So what do I mean? I mean that perhaps we should be operating uh, with Kubernetes, or Docker, or AutoML, or TensorFlow, or MongoDB, or I'll name various software applications. Now, a lot of people in this room would say, I don't know what you just said. Or leaders might say, eh, that sounds like a tactical level conversation. But it's the tactical choices of today that are the strategic decisions of tomorrow. So if we are going to recognize that commercial leads this sphere, then by deduction, we should be operating on the same delivery mechanisms. This does two things. Number one, it, drive down, it drives down cost for not only ourselves, but also for our partners, our industry itself. Whether that's private or public, all of a sudden we're messaging, you can expect us to operate on the same software, we can expect you not to spend 80% of money on business development, spend 80% demoing it with 
a user. And speaking of those users, that's an important note. For those of us in the government sphere, we actually know who our user is. And we can go out and talk to them anytime. The United States Air Force, my user is an 18-year-old airman fresh out of tech school. My user is an airman watching full motion video in a darkened room at 0100 Zulu hours. Our user is a young attorney who's spending far too much time looking for precedence on a case that we have uh, legislated multiple, multiple times. What that ends up doing is that user is frustrated and they leave and they're not happy. And this is a part of how AI makes lives better that we want a message. Principle two, treat data as a strategic asset. Okay, we've said that one before too. So what does that mean? Well, if we did treat data as a strategic asset, then our key performance parameters, our contracts, our actual acquisition strategy would reflect those things. What do I mean by that? There is a requirement for generating training quality data in every software application that we have. That perhaps we have government purpose rights upon, perhaps we don't, maybe we need them, but the actual requirements would reflect treating data as a strategic asset. I think for most of our organizations right now, we've seen the rise of C-suite executives. Uh, for the United States Air Force, we have a chief data officer, a chief software officer, a chief user interface and experience officer, and we have our typical CIO functions. Now those functions in themselves have now landed underneath the undersecretary of the Air Force not meant to reside in some only CIO lane or IT as an afterthought, because beforehand, the way that we looked at IT as organizations, as companies, as the federal government, was something to protect and preserve, not something that could be used to our advantage. So without senior leadership buy-in for any firm out there in the world, you will not get to a place in which you're using AI. You're not going to get to a place where you are collecting, measuring, and storing your data. And what we have learned, and this is an experience that, uh, that's good to go through, is you think about the pipeline from data engineering, building that training quality data, to actually modeling it and training, so running it on compute and all the other pieces, through integration by providing it to that actual user, which, again, companies of the world would pine and kill for to actually communicate with the user, and we can every day, and then finally for tuning and modeling and changing that over time, right? Here's kind of how it goes. You have 100% of your money for that budget. Right now, 40% is gonna be spent on data engineering. It's gonna shock you just what an experience that data engineering problem actually is when you're creating things that could be trained for machine learning applications. It's not the world in which you spend nine months saying, okay, I'm gonna go get a bunch of hard drives, go deliver it to all these NVIDIA GPUs or something to the effect, and then say, well, I must be able to make machine learning. Data engineering will take up a significant portion of your bill. In addition to that, because they are being integrated upon legacy systems, which is difficult, that will take up another 40% of the bill itself. And then all of a sudden you think, you realize I'm only spending 20% of the money on technology. And that's why for the second principle, we built it upon driving down technological barriers to entry so we can be smarter and safer about delivering AI. A lot of people will say, you know, as, as, as an organization, we are risk averse. It's a euphemism for being afraid of doing something. We are risk blind right now. We are taking risk, throwing over that proverbial wall to the user so that they can duct tape some solution together. And that's a difference in conversation that we haven't had. For principle three, I had mentioned before democratizing access to AI solutions. What am I talking about? GitHub. 99% of the machine learning things we'll build, and again, I'm 
hang up on machine learning because for AI as a broad concept, machine learning will fundamentally change our world for the next 10 years until something else comes along. And it will make a difference for the department and for the federal government in general. But we would surely be accessing these same things. We would surely be using the open natural language processing that's created. We would surely be using uh, all of the analytics functions for linear regression to you know, random forest trees to figure out, hey, I'm doubling down on this investment when I otherwise shouldn't be, or something to the effect. And there's one more point about this conversation that I think is important. The commercial sector has viewed it as a due diligence and a due right to make these things public and host them in the public space. And by the way, that's a hallmark of America. That's what we do. But let me give you an example of where that gets disconcerting. Right now, it, I, I don't know who has children in the room, if you can raise your hand. Uh, any kids out there play StarCraft and Dota and all these online battle games? They'll sit there forever. I mean, this industry itself for video games, games in general, which, which are important to our culture as, as humans, these games, if you added up the NBA, the NFL, the NHL, the MLB, all of that together, so Tom Brady's salary, the worth of Bob Kraft and Jerry Jones, everything else, it still does not touch the gaming market. The gaming market is bigger than the entire sports entertainment industry as we speak right now. And that's okay. It's, isn't that the new version of chess or Go and games we've played throughout all of society? It's just that new version. But as we speak right now, the thrust of artificial intelligence development happens on wargaming platforms. That game I just mentioned, StarCraft. Imagine, if you will, looking from a third-person view overhead. You have multiple actors, different armies or air forces. They have certain capabilities, like their planes or their people. And their goal is to overtake another base. In fact, they actually have the fog of war inside, because if you don't send out some scout or some capability to see what the enemy is doing, well, then you don't know what they're doing. The thrust of development is in reinforcement learning right now. That's the same technique that delivered us AlphaGo, everything else. And that is being hosted publicly for all of the world to develop AI upon. Now, war and socioeconomic norms and everything else is far more complex than some game. But at the same time, the tactical choices, the tactical things people can do with AI, well, that's shared for everybody right now. And we have to have that conversation and that dialogue because there is nothing more American in that. But most AI solutions already exist. They're in some repository online right now, and you can go pick them up. And we have to utilize those same things. So this third principle builds back upon we have the data access that we need in the contractual formats that we deem as appropriate, uh, along with the acquisition strategies. First off, commercial acquisition, PAR 12 acquisition would be something we generally do, not PAR 15. That would change if we recognize that commercial leads this sphere. And then we have those data pieces, and we operate on something that, of course, is hardened in nature, but it is to the same technical specifications that the world develops on. But people make AI. People make RPA. People discover the places where machine learning is appropriate. Yet when we talk about our workforce, right now, broadly speaking, we don't have this natural eye for AI, right? When I see a use case, what am I talking about? When I walk into the Pentagon every single morning, I come in on the second floor from the metro stop. <laughs> Inevitably, the elevator is on the fifth floor for no reason. <laughs> and that doesn't make sense. Because if you had an eye for AI or machine learning application, that's a perfect space for an elevator to say, well, in the morning, people come in on the second floor, and in the evening, they leave from the fifth floor. It's also the frustration we have with new elevators. When there are no buttons inside, it's because the companies realize they should also use machine learning and other types of technical uh, capabilities. But 
Our workforce is the most critical piece. Now here's a surprise. The United States Air Force are 88% millennials. Hashtag adults under 40, right? 88%. They all come from a background in which they had MySpace and they played on various games. MySpace, by the way, before Facebook, you know, you had to know HTML to make a really cool MySpace page. Every single person knows how to use these languages. And right now, if you're talking about a 17 or 18 year old, I promise that they know how to code or have an affinity for it. Yet we don't ask them these questions. Yet perhaps we say, well, that should be reserved for only IT professionals. When in fact, a lot of your workforce indigenously brought this capability and we're not asking them the question. If you walk back into your workplace, I'm willing to take an even bet that if you said, does anyone in here know how to program or code? Someone surely will raise their hand, say, yeah, I mine Bitcoin at home, or I like playing you know, Minecraft with my son or daughter. It's really important. So what are we doing about that? The United States Air Force just recently launched what we call the Computer Language Initiative. The Department of Defense and federal government more broadly has a long history of recognizing the critical and significant value that language has in our abilities to communicate, to work with partners, everyone else. We do it through two ways. A defense language aptitude battery test, i.e. is your brain naturally capable of learning new languages? And then furthermore, a defense language proficiency test that measures your skill set in said languages. Yet, those languages I'm talking about, they only apply to Farsi and Mandarin, Spanish and French, everything else, but not computer languages. And computer languages are the operative languages of our time. So for us, the United States Air Force is 450,000 strong. So what we did is we said, hey, if we're gonna treat it as a language, why don't we put out a self-assessment to our workforce, see what we actually have. It returned over 3,000 airmen who have identified themselves as being what they consider tier three Python coders capable of creating machine learning applications. Is that true? Probably not. Do they know Python? They absolutely do. Do they know Java? Of course they do. Can they work in our studio? Sure. Yet right now, some of those were dentists, some were pilots, some were of course intelligence professionals, but we should tap that workforce and think about that as a special and unique skill set because there is no field in the world that does not have an application for machine learning as we speak right now. So we're building those aptitude and proficiency tests. You'll see that it is reflected as well, uh, measuring aptitude and proficiency in the recent draft Senate NDAA for 2020. And I believe that we should take that further to the entirety of the federal government to signify that we are contemporary partners, to signify we are keeping up with the times, and to signify we will provide you a skill set that otherwise wouldn't exist or you wouldn't have an opportunity to learn. And for what it's worth, we've done this before. 1958, our Sputnik moment that we talk about. By the way, this 1958 when Sputnik launched is the same night Leave It to Beaver premiered. Society was in a totally different place. We were asleep at the wheel thinking that we were back-to-back -back world champs. Everything was fine. People were in home at classes. And the minute that happened, a lot occurred, right? From the creation of NASA and everything else. But furthermore, through bipartisan legislation, that all of a sudden we are going to influx through the National Defense Education Act a billion dollars in 1958 back into our education system for things like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, all the things that eventually won us the space race 10 years later when they came of age. We have to get to that space because just this past summer, documents surfaced in China where there are machine learning classes, 24 volumes that begin in kindergarten. That's where we're at right now. But these are the operative languages of our time and any agency could and should implement the same idea because the system already exists. The best way to hack the bureaucracy is to understand the bureaucracy. 
And for a nation, this is incredibly important. Here's the graduation rate. There will be 50,000 graduates this year who are qualified for 500,000 open jobs in software engineering. That number within four years jumps to a million. As the federal government, we could play a critical role in helping our national base get to a better place. And people sometimes say, well, what happens when they leave? What happens when we provide them this ability and then they decide to go? Good. That's great because it'll create the relationships we need for the next 25 years. And lastly, it's about relationships. I had mentioned briefly the difference in our regard for human dignity versus what else is happening in the world. And that conversation is growing. The recognition is happening for what's happening in West China, but we should be talking about that every single day because the natural values that you hold, that you espouse, that we have, will play themselves out through bias in your data sets and they will play themselves out in the choices you make with the IT you are running upon. And there is a difference from authoritarianism, for authoritarianism and democracy. Some would say, well, bias is bad. I just heard about all these hiring actions, you know, at Amazon, for instance, public knowledge, that through the resume uh, AI, they were only looking for what they've always looked for, you know, older white gentlemen. Well, here's the difference. We illuminated that conversation and now we're doing something about it. That's a conversation that doesn't happen in other places. And for our sharing agreements that were predominantly built upon these ideas of material things, engines, wings, computers, well, digital sharing agreements should change with our Western counterparts who do view society and human dignity in the same way. I was recently in a spout of writing, um, and I was thinking about what are we trying to message here? What are we trying to, trying to do as Americans right now? And I put this up, and, and, and it's important to read. Our focus now must be to openly address the current realities of AI so we can ensure to the best of our abilities that it is only implemented in ways consistent with our fundamental beliefs, and most importantly, only for purposes consistent with democratic dignities, laws, uh, and liberties. It's, yeah, I feel good about that. That, that makes sense. But it, there's more that had to come, right? It's not quite done. So I kind of added upon that. I said, to convince the public in particular that using AI to achieve these aims is a necessary and desirable part of our society, but we cannot afford to do so unless we know how it will best be used and when. But in the end, the future demands we make moral decisions as we begin to build a world that is truly safe and sustainable, one where humans and AI can truly coexist together. That hits the mark, except I didn't write those words. The first words that I gave you, I gave it to a natural language processing algorithm. And that's what it ended up coming up with on the first try. So if people don't think AI is real, here's where it stands. So thank you for this. I know we can open up conversations for a minute or so, um, but thank you for being here. This is a significant difference and we are getting traction. Friction makes traction, we're moving forward. And, and I think that should make us excited. Yeah, thank you, Captain Kanan. Um, we probably have a time for one or two questions. Uh, if, if any, we've got the microphone uh, roving around. Um, if not, we can, we've got one from the back. First, I want to say thank you, Captain, for coming in today and, and talking with us. Um, you, you put up a slide earlier that I found really interesting. You were talking about uh, computer language knowledge and human language knowledge. Mm -hmm. And I've known from my own experience that I just traveled to Spain and to Morocco. I don't speak Spanish, French, or Arabic, and I did just fine using Google Translate. Do you feel that increasingly in the next five years there should be even more impetus put on computer languages than 
human languages because eventually the computer languages will be able to translate the human? Uh, that's a great question. I think I had mentioned that they're the operative languages of our time. There's a philosophical intellectual debate that if you speak Java, but you're in you know, Morocco, and you speak Java, and you're in the United States, you're actually speaking the same languages and you see the same things. I think there's something to be said about that. Languages themselves, human languages, are what we call unconstrained languages. Uh, that's, that comes from our ability to use semantics and syntax to deliver any message. Computer languages are constrained in nature. You must be very precise. Here's an example. If you imagined up here, you know, you might say to someone, let's eat grandma, let's eat comma grandma. I mean, there's a very big difference between that. And computer languages have to pay attention to those things when you and I in conversation wouldn't have to. But the reality is, is these languages are becoming less constrained in nature over time. And I think as we digitize our world, that there should be a bigger impetus on our capabilities. We had mentioned the numbers themselves. That's not from only a socioeconomic standpoint that we have to pay attention to it, but in our ability to keep up with those who are competing against us otherwise, both privately and publicly. Got a couple questions Sir. on the left here. Where do you think the fastest exception rate of AI would be so I often say, I am, uh, you know, we need to get past this world and only talking about AI in war fighting operations. Perhaps one of the most difficult problem sets because of the, the, the natural responsibilities that we have, right? Um, in addition to the data and systems themselves. It takes a long time to deliver an F-16 or something to the effect and that goes for a lot of our organizations. The conversation has to go to back end business processes. So finance, it has to go to, uh, you know, for instance, right now we're, we're, we're moving towards generating what are called orders for our workforce before they actually move. Without those orders, they can't, you know, see a doctor or their primary care physician. So when they have a child, they go to an off-base uh, hospital and it costs $30,000. Yet we could use machine learning and RPA to generate that way beforehand and provide that, thus saving the taxpayer dollars. So it goes back to what Kirk mentioned earlier, is choosing uh, mission sets where you have specific outcomes and you understand what that business actually is. So in my mind, the fastest place for acceptance would be in finance, legal review, acquisition. Um, it would be in logistics. It wouldn't be on these unique farthest edge use cases because again, they're just the same mathematical techniques that will work for you know, command and control and war fighting operations. I wish we looked at the less sexy things more often. Got another question here. Thank you so much. Um, so you talked a little bit about the latent tech skills that most organizations have within them. Um, from my time in government, one of the big challenges I found is that a lot of times technical decisions and project management is structured only in an OCIO organization. What steps have you taken or would you take to kind of within an agency democratize ownership of technology to better harness you know, some of those latent skills? So industrial organizational psychology is a field for a reason and design thinking is a field for a reason. So the first thing is to create an organization that is not looked at and viewed as an afterthought. Um, I, for us, I mean, putting it at the top of the pyramid in an entity that is naturally not manned to the degree in which, um, in, in which they could say, I'll handle that internally, which we often say, what's, what's wildly expensive is being the sole developer and consumer of a technology. That has to end, and, and so often we keep doing that um, in that kind of pyramid scheme uh, that exists. But at the same time, you have to organizationally place it in a room where the proverbial boardroom has someone say, wait, 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 wait. There's an AI application for that. Wait, stop. IT matters, right? The entire federal government, frankly, most of the country needs a tech refresh, right? The capabilities we're talking about now do not run on the average computer systems that we have right now. Um, nor can you train it. So I would say that it begins organizationally where those tactical choices are strategic priorities. And frankly, just in the design of it, they end up being afterthoughts. 
All right, well, well please please uh, thank uh, Captain Kanan for, for a wonderful keynote. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. Thanks.